so thank you all. And uh, what I'd like to do is uh, turn now to our first speaker, uh, who uh, is joining us from India, Pawan Agarwal. Uh, and uh, let me turn everything at this point over to you, Pawan. Uh, the people uh, who are on the committee and participating in the workshop have uh, information on the uh, 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 biographies of, of all of the speakers. So uh, I will just note that you are chief executive of the Food Safety and Standards Authority in, in India. So we're looking forward to the comments based on your experience that you'll be sharing with us today. Uh, thank you, Catherine. Thank you once again uh, for inviting uh, me here to join you at this workshop. Uh, it is 7 p.m. in the evening here in Delhi today. And uh, before I start, you know, I have a short presentation uh, which my colleague will, you know, share with you. Uh, I'll begin by sharing the context in which we are speaking, you know, about the size of the country and the food system. Yes, please. Is there any, yeah, I think we just need to pull it up there. There we are. Okay. So can you see the presentation, please? Yes, yes. we can. Thank you. Okay, that's great. That's great. So can we move to the next slide? Yeah, so when we talk to India, we're talking 1.35 billion people, over 3 million licensed and registered food businesses. Our food system is still evolving. You know, it is in traditional phase, you know, most of us, you know, it is a rural economy. Large section of Indians eat, uh, you know, particularly the farmers eat what they produce. Uh, and among the businesses, there are small and tiny number, uh, tiny businesses, uh, you know, they're very large numbers, but we also have very modern food businesses and multinational corporations. There is a huge variety and diversity in food habits and cultures across the states and regions in the country. The food regulatory system is rather new. It was established under the Food Safety and the Standards Act of 2006, under implementation from 2011 onwards. We have merely 4,000 staff in the food safety in the national and provincial government taken together. In the National Food Authority, there are currently only 325 people. Uh, and taken together, uh, India spends about quarter of a billion dollars a year. Yes. The mandate of the Food Safety and the Standards Authority of India under the law is to ensure availability of safe and wholesome food for human consumption. I think this is a very broad mandate. And what is interesting to note here is the word wholesome food, you know, where by we mean the nutritious food for human consumption. Yeah. So I think the breadth of work of FSSCI, you know, from standard setting to import controls, licensing, registration, is, is very, very wide. And, but uh, I'll begin by saying that uh, uh, based on our mandate to ensure availability of safe and wholesome food for human consumption, and considering that our system is large, uh, so we basically look at it upside down, you know, if we can empower consumers so that they demand safe and nutritious food, then the businesses will have to provide that kind of a food in the market. And therefore, I, I think consumer empowerment comes first, and that is where we begin the story of FSSCI. So in empowering consumers, there are four strategic approaches that we are taking. You know, we take a 360-degree approach to promote safe and nutritious food. It is safe and nutritious food at home, safe and nutritious food at school, safe and nutritious food at workplace, and when we eat out, the street food, restaurant, hotels, even places of worship, railways and hospitals. You know, to trigger informed choices by consumers, in, in, FSSCI has introduced hygiene rating scheme for restaurants. We have declared street food hubs as clean street food hubs where consumers can be assured of 
hygienic and sanitized food, menu labeling has been introduced in India. Certifications and logos are in for organic food, for fortified food are increasingly popular. And consumer guidance notes, we keep on releasing consumer guidance notes to empower consumers. Now, further, you know, we work with other ministries and departments and government programs and empower the frontline workers under the health ministry, under the women and child uh, development ministry, so that they have good understanding of food safety and hygiene and nutritious food uh, when they reach out to their clientele. In terms of previous, uh, you know, in terms of outreach, we have taken up massive outreach programs, particularly in recent times. The Swat Bharat Yatra was a relay cyclothon wherein 22,000 kilometers were covered by about 21,000 cyclists. And uh, this is the kind of, uh, you know, reach wherein we could, uh, uh, we, 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 we could make about, we could touch base with about 25 million consumers across the country. Yes. Now, so first element was empowering the consumer. The second element of our strategy is to build a culture of self-compliance. And this culture of self-compliance has been initiated through a program called Food Safety Training and Certification. Uh, this is a low cost model, market driven model, where the training providers, most of the training providers are funded directly by the food businesses because the training costs are very little. And we work with state governments and corporates. About 4,000, over 4,000 trainings have been conducted covering about 118,000 food safety supervisors uh, across the country in various uh, uh, kinds of food businesses. Uh, there is also a third party audit system and rating mechanisms and responsibility of aggregators. You know, I would mean that India has an interesting ecosystem wherein we have e-commerce players, both packaged food and uh, uh, served food, and they are responsible to ensure that the, the entire ecosystem is uh, 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 complied with the regulatory environment. Uh, so these first two were the key elements and we would say innovative elements of our system, wherein we are trying to address the issue of size and fragmentation. It comes to the traditional functions of any regulatory body, which is setting standards, you know, to boost food processing and also uh, to ensure innovation in the food processing sector. Uh, uh, you know, as I mentioned that uh, we started our work only in 2011-12, but most of the standards, technical standards and regulations are now in place. And uh, we are uh, in the process of after the food supplements and nutraceutical regulations, organic regulations, in the process of finalizing our regulations on GM food. Uh, and this is done largely through scientific panels and committees, which uh, comprise of people from academic and research institutions and not businesses from across the country. Uh, then India has perhaps one of the largest licensing and registration system for food businesses. About 0 0.5, 0 0.6 million large food businesses are licensed and another 2.4 million small and tiny food businesses are registered under a common, through a, on a common IT platform. And this is you know, we have recently revisited and streamlined our licensing and registration processes in order to facilitate and ensure that, uh, uh, you know, the hassleless, uh, uh, the, the food businesses do not uh, find it, uh, you know, find, uh, you know, problems in licensing and registration. Next. Now, uh, as far as the enforcement is concerned, India is a federal economy and therefore, much of the uh, functions of enforcement are delegated to state food authorities. And uh, this is done through a digital matrix based inspection system. Our inspections are risk based. We have recently, as I mentioned before, uh, uh, streamlined our processes to reduce the burden of inspections on food businesses. We also uh, have recently started uh, impaneling third-party audit agencies 
in hygiene rating agencies to support the work of inspections and enforcement of uh, our regulatory staff. Uh, uh, under FSCI, as I met, there is a network of 266 food laboratories. Over half of them are private uh, laboratories. Only less than half are under the government. FSSI itself has two state-of-the-art laboratories. One of them runs on a public-private partnership model, which we inaugurated recently. We've also set up mobile food testing units and rapid testing uh, uh, devices and uh, the kits for popularizing food testing across the country. Yes. Now, uh, food control system in India, you know, is directly managed by the FSSAI at 20 locations. There are, however, another 150 points of entry which are managed by custom authorities, and we work with the custom authorities uh, to ensure that uh, uh, the uh, food imported in the country is safe. Uh, the entire system is driven by IT uh, platform and. Uh, we are continuously learning from international experiences to streamline our import processes. Now, in total, what we can see is that uh, with a very small contingent of staff, recently we got uh, approvals for another 500 staff. So altogether, India's FSSCI will have 825 staff against 14,200 staff in USDA and FDA for food uh, 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 regulatory under the food regulation itself uh, against a budget of 2.2 billion dollars that USDA and FDA spends annually. Uh, India altogether spends about, you know, uh, we spend FSSCI spends around 20 billion dollars. So we are focusing on partnerships and technology to achieve scale and uh, uh, to ensure that we continue to be effective even with the small budgets and uh, little budget and a small budget and uh, um, a small, uh, less number of staff. So these partnerships are horizontal, vertical. You know, we work with the different ministries, national and international industry and professionals. Finally, I will sum up by saying that, uh, you know, we are trying to develop our own model for food regulatory system in the country. And we have looked at uh, food regulatory environments elsewhere in the world. And uh, uh, Stephen Jaffe, you know, who is the lead author of a World Bank publication, The Safe Food Imperative, he had this to say, you know, he, he basically, uh, I would like to, I would like you to focus on uh, the point that he has highlighted. Developing countries should not be lured into the promise of technocratic approach and create their own massive FDA implementing agency. I think for low income and middle income countries, uh, I think the con such countries have to find their own models for food safety to ensure that th their arrangements fit in the context in which uh, their food system is evolving. Thank you very much. Great. Well, thank you very much for sharing with us um, the experience with the Food Safety and Standards Authority in India. Um, we have uh, a, almost 15 minutes for discussion with you. We, we recognize that it's very late in India uh, after a long day, uh, but we very much appreciate your being with us. So let me open it up and uh, begin by asking uh, the committee members uh, to indicate if you have any questions. So we'll start with Jono and then uh, follow up with Veronica. Jono? Yeah. <clears throat> Uh, thank you, Mr. Agarwal. You came through loud and clear. D two questions. Um, one, it was, it's, it's uh, fascinating that you started with consumers and building their, that, that that's the first step, not the sort of heavy hand of regulation, as it were. So one question is, um, how did you get there? Because I think that idea may have struck some people as, as uh, revolutionary. Um, I don't know, but that, so that's one question is, is how you got uh, consensus around that is the sort of leading edge. The second is <clears throat> under the theme of doing more with less. Um, and also when you talked about the, the, uh, the state involvement, 
Um, you talked about, I can't remember the use, word you used, but sort of contracting out some of it, and on the partnerships, that came under the more for less. And one of the dynamics in regulation is always this issue of regulatory capture, that the people being regulated find ways of, of, of um, you know, getting the decisions they want. We, we have obviously a high profile thing in the airline industry now around whether that happened. So what do you, how do you ring fence or protect the integrity of the, uh, of the regulatory process uh, while also co-opting and bringing in these other resources? Uh, Over and out. You. I think, yeah, okay. <laughs> I think uh, both are excellent questions, you know. Uh, starting with consumer first uh, was an obvious uh, choice for India. Because, uh, uh, you know, if, you, if we ask ourselves uh, why we exist, the answer is quite simple. We exist because we want to ensure public health for our citizens. So consumers come first. And if consumers come first, and if they can, if they can create that demand pool uh, for safe and nutritious food, then businesses will have uh, no option but to supply that in the marketplace. So I think this strategy has, has worked quite well. And it also helped India's food authority, which is rather new, to get visibility in public eye and uh, become uh, more relevant for citizens overall. So I think uh, this was easy bit. On, on partnerships, I think this issue of conflict of interest and regulatory capture is something that we are aware of and we are concerned about it and we uh, take care of it that uh, when we are doing a partnership, uh, such issues are addressed uh, effectively. I'll give you an instance. Only yesterday, we inaugurated a facility of uh, uh, food safety solution center, which has been established by Thermo Fisher, you know, which is co-located on on the premises of our own lab, and uh, this is essentially to build capacities of uh, 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 food laboratory staff around the country in uh, various other government and private labs, but. When we are developing the curriculum for that, for training courses, the, uh, the training courses are, you know, equipment agnostic. They are brand agnostic. And uh, I think uh, these small measures to see that there is no regulatory capture and there are no conflict of interest while we are working in different kind of partnerships are very important. And uh, they will play out in different ways in different circumstances. In our consumer empowerment efforts, we, uh, you know, work with the uh, networks of food businesses and their, uh, you know, associations very significantly. And uh, uh, I think uh, in all such activities, you know, ensuring that uh, uh, there is no messaging uh, that goes out as if we are endorsing a particular brand or particular company, uh, we, we do take care of that. But I know that... Uh, uh, this is this will continue to be a very very difficult issue and a tightrope walk as we move forward. Thank you, Thank you. Uh, Veronica. Thank you very much for the presentation. Very interesting. Two questions. One question related to the. Um, St rolling out to d different states regulation across different states. Um, how difficult or how challenging is it to maintain a uniformity of the regulations across states? So I'm wondering, what are the variations across states? Um, is it difficult to Im uh, implement the, the regulations across state in a very uniform way? What kind of autonomy do different states have in terms of their regulation? And then the second question is a bit about the role of the consumers. Do the consumers also have roles in different committees within your agencies? So we have discussed in the past role of consumers in terms of participation in terms of different uh, commission, uh, committees within your agency. Can you comment on that? Thank you. Yeah, thank you, thank you. I think uh, this is a, a serious challenge because India is a large country. We have 29 states. 
and uh, uh, you know seven centrally administered uh, administered uh, territories. So uh, you know implementation of the food safety law varies across the states and territories, and that is the reality. So while they are all supposed to be implementing the same law, the way it uh, you know, uh, it works out in different states is different because a little bit of culture of that state about individual officers, their staff, uh, you know, so all that matters. And to ensure that there is one nation and one food law, and that was the slogan that we took in last year, 2018, uh, we created, uh, you know, manuals on food safety, which went beyond the law and regulations to practices that uh, the food regulatory staff need to follow at the field level. This has helped a little bit, but I would say that this will continue to be a challenge for us with a country where, where we have that, such diversity across the states and across regions. On, on the second question about uh, uh, consumer organizations being represented on our authority, yes, we have uh, uh, in fact, two, uh, two committees at the national level. One is the Food Authority itself, where two people from consumer organizations are represented on the, on the Food Authority. And in addition to that, we have a Central Advisory Council, which comprises of food safety commissioners of all states. And there again, there are three representation, uh, representatives from the consumer organizations that are represented on this body. Similarly, at the state level committees, there are consumer organizations that have a voice, they are represented on those committees. Thank you. Um, we have four committee members with questions. So the next one uh, will be uh, Prashant, who's been joining us by phone. So, Prashant. Thanks, Catherine. Um, Mr. Agarwal, thank you for the presentation. In a similar vein to Veronica's question, I wanted to ask presumably, there are state level monies that go into the portion of implementing the food law which states carry out and there are you know federal central level monies which go to through fssai so is there a body or a, or a platform where you bring together uh, to understand how monies for state level implementation of food safety are allocated every year are there learnings on how to advocate for more resourcing um, those states who've done better in finding such monies, connecting them with states who not historically spent as much um, of their resourcing on food regulation. So is there a platform that brings them together, helps them exchange such um, sort of best practice knowledge? Thank you. Uh, no, Prashant, as I mentioned, you know, uh, the Central Advisory Council where all food safety commissioners are represented is one such forum but it's not very helpful because uh, the purse strings uh, in the states are controlled by the finance department and uh, uh, the food safety commissioners have no influence on what monies are allocated to them. Traditionally, there are states where, uh, you know, the food safety is uh, fairly well funded and there are other states where there are challenges in funding. So what we have done is we have recently tried to put together a food safety index, which is not really in terms of outcomes, but in terms of staffing, activities, labs, infrastructure, all that stuff. And we are creating a competition between states and also through the media because that food safety index and their, the basis on which it is you know, the, the, the metrics, the entire metrics will be available to media, to public at large, and therefore create competition between the states that they should provide adequate resources for, for food safety. Last year, we brought together health ministers of the states on a common platform under the banner of FSSCI, and one of the key points of discussion was resourcing for food safety in the states. But that was also not very helpful. So I think we are trying to find ways how to, uh, you know, uh, how to nudge states to spend more on food safety. Great. So Thank some, you. 
Thank you. Uh, and why don't we get the next three questions out on the table? Uh, so, Marcus, why don't you start, then Julie and Maria Elena, and then uh, Mr. Agarwal, you can answer all of them in whatever order you, you please. So, first question for Marcus. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, so I'm, I'm, again, I'm Marcus from Rutgers Business School. Uh, so my question uh, aims to build off of your opening comments on consumer empowerment. Um, there's a relatively controversial idea that there's some uh, natural trade-off between price and safety standards or food quality. Um, I'm, and, that, and that, in turn, relates a bit to the existence of informal markets and formal markets and um, the possibility that... Uh, that large parts uh, of the of the market in a poor country like India might go relatively unregulated. Uh, I'm I'm curious to hear your thoughts uh, or, or the sort of the Indian government's uh, uh, strategy um, um, around around this issue. The degree to which you would accept the idea that there's this type of a trade-off. Um, and and so the the degree to which you'd see there there potentially being some segmentation of the market in terms of regulation. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. This is Julie Caswell. I was wondering if you could speak a bit about how your agency goes about the overall your overall strategy towards risk. So, what kind of uh, data do you uh, develop or use to decide which are the areas that need the most attention for new regulations and for um, and for enforcement. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, Mr. Agar. Well, uh, my name is Marilena Botazzi, and my question relates to the uh, personnel that you have uh, in your agency, and maybe if you can comment a little bit what kind of um, capability skills, uh, of course, are needed, and where do you capture your personnel? You alluded that there's, of course, not very many if you compare it to, you know, the number of employees that USFDA has, for example. You know, maybe comment about retention, you know, what kind of partnerships you have to gather the best uh, uh, staff, uh, and how do you do their training and continuous professional advancement? Thank you. Thank you. I think I'll, I'll take the three questions in the same order and the way they were presented on, you know, segmentation of uh, the India's food market. Uh, I, also, I already mentioned to you that a large part of uh, uh, India's food system is still, uh, you, know, uh, you know, a traditional food system, even though we have many, many, uh, you know, big corporations, including multinationals. Uh, you know, who are increasing their market share in food, including uh, the quick service restaurants. Uh, almost all major chains across the world now have operations in India and they're they are expanding quite rapidly. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, the trade-off between food safety and pricing, uh, this issue uh, uh, does come up once in a while, but it's not a major issue. I think the way we present it is that unsafe food can be far more expensive than safe food. And uh, uh, currently, we are only focused around issues of hygiene. I think our standards on residues of pesticides, residues of heavy metal, antibiotic residues, and uh, such issues, we are building capacities and we are, we are putting standards in place and once uh, that ecosystem comes into uh, play, then perhaps this issue will be, uh, you know, uh, far more, uh, uh, you know, nuanced for us to address. Uh, and in that, uh, you know, the interesting part that is happening in India is a large part of informal sector is getting formalized by using e-commerce platforms. So, for instance, uh, 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 you know, at least in major cities in the country, uh, a lot of fruits and vegetables from small growers are reaching households through the e-commerce platforms. 
you know, and the same is happening with we have very large number of, uh, you know, restaurants and including small kitchens that supply what they cook through the delivery, uh, you know, platforms. Uh, so this formalization of the informal sector is another interesting development. And we have taken this, uh, this as an opportunity and using these uh, aggregators or e-commerce players uh, to put pressure on these informal uh, businesses to, to look at food safety and hygiene you know, seriously. So I think uh, this is an issue uh, that is still evolving. Uh, and I, I, I hope I have, I, have, I have made my point clear. Julie, as far as the data uh, for, uh, you know, working out plan for new regulatory standards to come in, in, you know, our food authority is rather new. As I mentioned that we are just six, seven years old and uh, our standards are now coming into shape. Uh, our labs are getting established. So we do not have uh, 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 we do not have an existence of uh, uh, you know uh, very robust uh, data systems. There are some data uh, you know on pesticide residue and a few other safety issues that are available with other ministries and agencies. Currently, we largely depend on it, but now we are moving on to take up large scale surveillance activities across the country. And over a period of time, we hope to build, uh, you know, uh, large data systems which will support us in setting regulatory standards for food. Uh, as far as the personnel is concerned, you know, uh, thus far we were working with uh, much of uh, our staff in the national agency is on short-term contract. They are young people. You know, uh, uh, very bright people that we have chosen through a competitive process, and they have learned uh, things on the job. But now that we are hiring another 500 people, uh, you know, we are in the process of developing HR systems and doing uh, an ongoing professional, uh, you know, uh, development systems so that we can do this uh, this work in a better manner. So I think this, as far as Staffing and professional development is concerned. This is ongoing uh, in India as of now. Thank you very much. Hey, well, thank you very much for sharing part of your evening with us and uh, as well uh, your uh, experience with uh, food safety regulation in India. I hope that we'll be able to follow up with you if the committee has any additional questions as we consider all the information that you've provided to us. And you're more than welcome to, to stay on uh, and participate in the workshop, but uh, we also understand that uh, it's late in the day for you, and and uh, you may have other things that that uh, will will take priority. But again, thank you so much, Mr. Agarwal, and uh, you've provided some very helpful information to this committee. Thank, thank you, Catherine, and uh, I'll uh, I'll ask my office to share some more information with you, you know, uh, which might be helpful in the work of the committee, uh, and uh, uh, you know. Unfortunately, I'll have to leave, but uh, one or two of my colleagues will stay on for the next two sessions uh, to, to, to listen to the deliberations. In the Wonderful. Thank, Thank you so much.